What a great audience. Thank you for coming out tonight to hear from Claudia Rankin and Carrie Mae Weems. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Flom, Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. And on behalf of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, our valued partner, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, and tonight's co-presenter, the University of Pittsburgh Center for African American Poetry and Poetics. <laughs> Welcome. Classic Lines, Books and More is here. So you can purchase books and support a great independent local bookstore. A quick note to tell you that Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures concludes our 10 evening season on Monday, April 1st with novelist Min Jin Lee. The event is sold out, but don't despair. You can call our office after noon that day or come to the box office at 6 p.m. because we do get tickets turned back from subscribers. Introducing our speakers tonight, on behalf of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics is CAP director and co-founder, Don Lundy Martin. <laughs> Don, as you know, is a poet, essayist, and conceptual video artist. She is author of many award-winning collections, including a Gathering of Matter, A Matter of Gathering, winner of the Cave Canem Prize, Discipline, winner of the Night Boats Book Poetry Prize, and Life in a Box is a Pretty Life, winner of a Lambda Literary Award. Her conceptual video work has been exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit and other places. Her essays can be found in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, and Book Forum. Please give a warm welcome to Don Lundy Martin. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, well, I'm extremely excited to be here. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to this very special evening. Um, we are thrilled to present tonight two extraordinary artists who have made substantial impact on a lot of different concerns, but also how we think of race in America, Carrie Mae Weems and Claudia Rankin. This night is made possible by many individuals, organizations, and entities, including our community partner, Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, the Dietrich School of the Arts and Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh, and the Dietrich Foundation, that's where all of our money comes from. And also thanks to, um, especially thanks today, but always to uh, the stellar CAP graduate student uh, assistant, Jessica Lene Moore, and CAP assistant director, Lauren Russell, for holding down the fort today while I attended to some emergencies. <laughs> thanks as always, though. Um, and there's a special thank you uh, tonight before I get started with the official introductions. I, I want to thank um, the outgoing chair of the English department, Don Bialystowski, who um, he has a few more months as chair of the English department at Pitt, but he was really critical to supporting and helping to enact the visionary creation of CAP in the first place three years ago. Don convened a meeting with me and Terrence Hayes and Yona Harvey, wanting to think about how we at Pitt could do something special in and around black poetry. And it was at this meeting that the idea for the center emerged in kind of a casual brainstorm. Um, and tonight, after the event is over, we'll certainly raise a glass to Professor Bielostowski, but I wanna thank him here too in front of all of you uh, for his critical support in bringing CAP into being. So please join me in applause and thank you to Don. It was, in fact, three years ago, um, kind of shortly there after we came up with the idea for the center that then co-director Terrence and I dreamed up bringing Claudia Rankin and Carrie Mae Weems together in Pittsburgh to share their work and be in conversation. 
um, and I was mentioning this in the green room, we didn't actually dream it up because we stole the idea. Um, we saw that it had happened um, at the New York Public Library um, with Kabe Kanem as a sponsor, and um, they had hosted a conversation between Rankin and Weems in New York, but neither Terrence nor I could be there. So we thought we could, you know, <laughs> encourage them, uh, woo them uh, to come to Pittsburgh um, and have a conversation here. And it's my great honor that they uh, decided to do so and to introduce Carrie Mae Weems and Claudia Rankine. Though for sure, few in the audience are strangers to their works. I have long been a fan of Weems's art, um, having been particularly drawn initially to the way that she juxtaposes text and image in her series uh, titled, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried, 19. 95 to 1996. Um, this may be because I'm a poet, I'm really interested in that juxtaposition, but um, what she does is she uses images taken of black slaves in the mid 1800s by Harvard scientist Louis Agassi in his work uh, toward attempting to support his hypothesis that black people and white people are from different origins and therefore different species, one inferior to the other, one superior to the other. You can imagine which. Um, so she takes these images, um, borrows them, appropriates them, and uh, in her work though, the images are overlain with text resulting in a series of alternate narratives um, that liberate the image from their faux scientific origins. Some years after I encountered this work, I was asked to be one of four poets in residence, um, and my colleague Yona Harvey was among them at the Montclair Art Museum in Montclair, New Jersey. For several days, the museum was closed, and we poets were given free reign to explore the museum with our individual guards behind us to create new poems inspired by the work that we saw. Uh, I was deeply drawn in by Weems's work again, this time framed by modernism, which is ostensibly, I think it's supposed to be a portrait, or an originally was supposed to be a portrait of um, artist Robert Colescott. And But in the three images, um, he's in the front of the frame, and she appears in the rear of the frame um, in a corner, nude. Um, and, this was the first time, actually, that I had written anything directly related to visual art, but it was the beginning of a practice that would infuse my work. And um, I want to share a little bit of what I, I wrote with you. It's a six-page poem, so I only read a tiny, tiny little bit. But um, just to give you a sense of the effect that the work had on me, and the poem um, is, has a long title. It's called Modern Frame or a Philosophical Treatise on What Remains Between History and the Living, Breathing, Black Human Female after Carrie Mae Weems is framed by Modernism, 1996. To feel a presence, they say, can be like a haunting. You are yourself and no other physical being is there, yet a feeling or sensation emerges as if from nowhere like the negress, the black female body, not in repose, instead walking or clickety-clack. It knocks at the door, which is the surface of existence, or in life it walks down the street and is asked to assume a position of slackness in response to the perception of being in perpetual heat. What would we do without her? How would we know ourselves? Indeed, we need something against which the pristine can manifest itself, can create its artifice of pristineness. It was beginning of something. Um, it actually, the poem began, be, now begins my third book called Life in a Box is a Pretty Life. Um, and I mentioned this engagement at length here because it also begins my thinking about the possible fruitful relation or interplay between poetry and visual art. This experience is also one of the seeds for the work we do here at CAP. 
where poetics for us is a place of discovery and the act of making or the surprising collision of two artistic genres. Weems's body of art stirs deeply and its rhetorical enactments around a range of concerns, family relations, cultural identity, racism, sexism, class, political systems, consequences of power and more. Her work unsettles in part because of the restlessness and rigor of the approach. And as Holland Cotter wrote in the New York Times of her retrospective, Ms. Weems is what she has always been, a superb image maker and a moral force, focused and irrepressible. And it's, it's simply thrilling, once again, to have her here tonight and to introduce her work. Um, I will read some of the official bio. Um, I will not read the whole thing because it would take too much time. <laughs> uh, it's very, it's, you know, there's a lot. Um, Weems has participated in numerous solo and group exhibitions at major national and international museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Frist Center for Visual Art, Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York in the Centro, uh, and Dulles de Arte Contemporaneo, my Spanish is so horrible, in Seville, Spain. Weems has received numerous awards, grants, and fellowships, including the prestigious Pre de Roma, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Alpert, the Anonymous Was a Woman, and the Tiffany Awards. In 2012, Weems was presented with one of the first U.S. Department of State's Medals of Arts in recognition for her commitment to the State Department's Art and Embassies program. In 2013, Weems received the MacArthur Genius Grant as well as the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. She has also received the BET Honors Visual Artist Award the Lucy Award for Fine Art Photography, uh, and she was one of four artists honored in the Guggenheim's 2014 International Gala, a recipient of the ICP Spotlight Award and the International Center of Photography, the W.E.B. Du Bois Award from Harvard University, as well as honorary degrees from um, the California College of the Arts, Colgate University, Bowdoin College and School of Visual Arts and Syracuse University. She is um, represented, of course, in public and private collections around the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Museum of Modern Art New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, and the Tate Modern London. So I ask you to give her a round of applause, even though she's not coming up quite yet, uh, for Carrie Mae Weems. So tonight, however, we bring together two women who reach and, um, and uh, shatter artistic uh, expectations of what art and language can do. I was first introduced to Claudia Rankine as a doctoral student. I was enthralled by her third collection of po poetry titled Plot, partly because of the way it confounded me and forced me to return again and again to its odd lexicon and syntax. According to the poet and critic Wayne Kostenbaum, um, his review of her second collection, The End of the Alphabet, the critic cannot summarize or do justice to this kind of poetry, which like vintage action painting, achieves power through the language's gestural, nearly non-representational emergence. And so it was that engagement that I was really interested in. And um, I want to give you a sample from her, for, from, that, from, that, from that book. Um, encourage you to read it. Uh, this is from Plot, uh, which is kind of a meditation on pregnancy and the transformation of the body. And this is the kind of language I was drawn to. It's very short, the excerpt. Ersatz, a freehand sketchiness of hollow form, anonymous, delineation of bone, of muddy hue dipped in fetal city. Oh, so neatly laid within live, a 
estranged interlacing that she is. I was so taken by this collection, I wrote a chapter of my dissertation on Rankin's work, but also in a kind of unrestrained impulse, I scavenged her email from the internet and um, wrote to her. <laughs> and I had done this weird thing in the dissertation. I was you know, reading the poems and had placed this grid over one of the sections of um, one of her earlier works. And, you know, and then I had given a reading of the poem with this grid over it and I sent it to her. And she, I, I didn't know her, and she didn't know me. <laughs> but to my surprise, she wrote back. I don't know if you remember this, Claudia, but um, I can credit this moment, actually, as the start of um, a correspondence and inevitably a friendship, and a friendship that focuses on, in part, a conversation on black radical poetics and poetry that refuses, refuse both of them to be settled or to settle. And what I love about uh, Rankine's oeuvre is that within each work, it's like each work is divergent from the previous work, even as the previous seems to produce it. Each work innovates on its own terms, inventing like newly conceived books of poems that look like no other book of poems you have ever seen before. She gives us all permission to re-script what we think a poem is and what kind of power it can have in the world. You cannot sleep in her presence, nor would I want to, for to be in conversation with her is to be in deep pleasure of what it means and what it feels like to rethink what you think you already know. Now on to some of the official bits. What we think we know about race, this monumental fiction that is almost, um, that is also most real in our sociality and in our daily lived experience is Rankine's current concern. Rankine's um, best-selling book, Citizen and American Lyric, Gray Wolf 2014, uses poetry, essay, cultural criticism, and visual images to explore what it means to be an American citizen in a post, quote unquote, post-racial society. A defining text for our time, Citizen was the winner of the 2015 Forward Prize for Best Collection, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. It was also a finalist in the category of criticism, making it the first book in the award's history to be a double nominee the NAACP's Image Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and the LA Times Book Award for Poetry. Citizen was nominated for the Hurston Wright 2015 Legacy Award and was a finalist for the 2014 National Book Award. Um, and um, the NPR Best Book, it was selected as an NPR Best Book of 2014. And this is what they say about the book. This collection examines everyday concerns with racism, in the second person, forcing the reader, regardless of identity, to engage a narrative haunted by the deaths of Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, and Renisha McBride. Citizen also holds a distinction of being the only poetry book to be a New York Times bestseller in the nonfiction category, which I love. Okay, um, she's the author of five collections of poetry, obviously Citizen, also, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, two plays including The White Card, which premiered in February 2018 and will be published, has just recently been published, it's here, been published, it's here, by Grey Wolf Press and The Providence of Beauty, a South Bronx travelogue, as well as numerous video collaborations. She is the editor of several anthologies, including The Racial Imaginary, Writers on Race and the Life of the Mind, in 2016, she co-founded the Racial Imaginary Institute, TRII. Among her numerous awards include the ones that I said before, but also the Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry, the Jackson Poetry Prize, also a MacArthur Genius Grant, and fellowships from Guggenheim Foundation, Lannan, United States Artist and the National Endowment for the Arts. She teaches at uh, Yale University, where she is a professor and lives in New Haven, 
and she is also a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. So please, a, a round, she's not coming up quite yet, but a round of applause for Claudia Rankin. Okay, so um, this is how it's gonna go down. Um, Claudia Rankin will present her work first, uh, and then Carrie Mae Weems, and then I will join them on stage for a brief moderated discussion. We will take a few questions as well after that from the audience. Book sales and signing will follow. Please join me in welcoming just the whole evening, the whole evening, thank you very much. Good evening. It's it's such an honor to be here. I, you know, I Dawn. I you know I don't know what she's talking about. Dawn and I met in another life, <laughs> and I can't believe she doesn't remember that. So then we bumped into each other in this life, and I was like, "Hey, sis." I, I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Arts and Lecture, um, and um, certainly Stephanie from who greeted us today and whisked us in and mic'd us up, and it was all great. And um, Lauren Russell for helping me create. I didn't know I was going to do what I'm going to do, <laughs> and I, I um, Don and I saw. Well, we were doing an event; it wasn't random. And Lauren, I said to Lauren, do you think we could find some actors? And then she did it. <laughs> uh, or with help, with help, <laughs> apparently. She found some, she found some actors. Um, and so now I can do this other thing. But before I get to it, I want to say what an honor it is to share an evening with the great Carrie Mae Weems. It, Seems like there's some equivalence in these introductions, but there is none. <laughs> I have watched this woman work from afar for all of my life. I, I remember, um, in fact, had I done what I was going to do, you would have seen her work up there tonight because it has framed everything that I have done. In fact, it's framed everything that you have done. You just might not know it. <laughs> so thank you, Carrie, for everything you've done and for leading the way in terms of reframing the place and creating a new narrative for black women, not just as artists, but as subject. You did it all by your little self. <laughs> So tonight, um, I am going to read um, the introduction to the white card. And um, the actors, Kelsey Robertson, Ken Bolden, and Sheila Carter-Jones, Sheila is going to narrate, and um, Kelsey and Ken will read scene two of the white card. Um, the preface is what I will read to you. One evening, during a question and answer session, a white middle-aged man stood up. After movingly addressing my reading from Citizen, he asked me, what can I do for you? How can I help you? As I stood on stage regarding him, I wondered how to move his question away from me, my story, my body, to the more relevant issues and dynamics regarding American history and white guilt. Teje Cole's essay, The White Savior Industrial Complex, came back to me in that moment. Maybe it would have been better to use Cole's words directly, to quote his extension of Anna Arendt's Into the Realm of Whiteness. 
the quote is, the banality of evil transmutes into the banality of sentimentality. The world is nothing but a problem to be solved by enthusiasm, end of quote. S or this, quote, the white savior industrial complex is not about justice. It is about having a big emotional experience that validates privilege, end of quote. But in the moment, I decided to climb out from behind all my reading, references, and quotes and engage his question personally without the distancing scaffold of referential speak. His question struck me as an age-old defensive shield against identifying with acts of racism at the hands of liberal, well-meaning white people, the kind he had just listened to me read about, his question did the almost imperceptible work of positioning him outside the problems citizen interrogates while maintaining his position of superiority relative to me in his act of offering to help me. He would help answer not only my problems, but those of all black people, which he only at this, at that moment recognized, but otherwise was not implicated in or touched by. He seemed oblivious to the realization that our problems as a society are dependent on his presence, despite my project of saying this in all the ways I know how. The afterlife of white supremacy to appropriate and flip on its head Sidia Hartman's The Afterlife of Slavery is all our problem. Cole writes, all he sees is need, and he sees no need to reason out the need for the need. End of quote. If he were to reason out the need for the need, he would understand he need not invite himself to the scene. He is already there. There was so much that could be said about the often meaningless reparative legesse of whiteness in the face of human pain and suffering. But in the minutes we had for our exchange, I simply responded to the man, I think the question you should be asking is what you can do for you. He didn't appreciate my answer. <laughs> From inside his theater of noblesse oblige, which seems to come close to condescendence, but really exists in the depths of repression of American complicity with structural anti-black racism, rose an anger that I confess I didn't expect. If that is how you answer questions, he responded, then no one will ask you anything. The germinal thought, the originating impulse of the white card, came out of this man's question and his response to my response. In his imagination, where did I go wrong? Was I initially intended to express gratitude for his interest? Were his feelings and the feelings of the audience in general my first priority? Was recognition of his likability a necessary gateway into his ability to apprehend my work? I really wanted to have the conversation he started. I didn't have, I didn't come all this way not to engage. But as the affect theorist Lauren Ballant has stated, quote, what does it do to one's attachment to life to have constantly to navigate atmospheres of white humorlessness, end of quote. It seemed to me after this incident that an audience member 
my read all the relevant books on racism, see all the documentaries and films, and know the correct phrases to mention. But in the moment of dialogue or confrontation, retreat into the space of defensiveness, anger, silence, which is to say, he might retreat into the comfort of control, which begins by putting me back in my imagined place. Perhaps any discussion of racism does not begin from a position of equality for those involved. Maybe the expectation is for the performance of something I, as a black woman, cannot see even as I object to its presence. Perhaps the only way to explore this known and yet invisible dynamic is to get in a room and act it out. Theater is by its very nature a space for and of encounter. The writing of the white card was a way to test and imagine conversation regarding race and racism among strangers. The dinner party as a social setting for a sharing of both space and conversation in the home of a white family seemed the benevolent, natural, if not exactly neutral, site. The characters have come together to consider the terms of an exchange of art. While they get to know one another, what brings everyone to the room is a desire to be seen and known. But what keeps them there is the complexity of our human desire to be understood. So the white card, what you're not seeing is scene one. And in scene one, we're in the home of Charles and Virginia Spencer. They have invited Charlotte Cummings, an artist um, who is a photographer, much like um, Jeff Wall. She restages um, crime scenes that have never been seen. That's her work. And she's done um, a series of the basement of that church where nine African Americans were slaughtered. We've never seen that crime scene, and that's her work. Charles has decided he would like to purchase that work for his foundation. So um, his um, arts representative, Eric Smith, has come to the house, and they've invited their son, Alex, because they feel like he would be interested in meeting Charlotte. He's a college student um, involved in activism. So in scene one, the dinner party takes place. And it, in a way, it was meant to be performa. They would meet Charlotte. Charlotte would meet them. And the deal, as it is, would go off and everybody would go home, or she would go back home. But instead what happens is that they use the dinner party as a moment to give to their son a piece of art that they have bought for him. And when Charlotte sees that work, she understands that she is contributing to a certain narrative around black bodies and handing those dead black bodies over to the white imagination. And um, so she leaves after, you can imagine, a few disruptions. Um, and what you will see this evening in the reading is will occur a year later. Um, Charles has called Charlotte. Um, and asked to come and see her because she's just opened a new show. I, uh, I was downstairs in my, my room the other day crying. 
asking myself, where am I? Where am I and who am I? And I remember my father talking so uh, profoundly about uh, his search for his father, his looking for his father, his search for himself, really, through all of this history that is being played out here. So um, there is extraordinary wreckage. And out of, out of this wreckage also comes extraordinary invention, extraordinary levels of invention, new patterns, new modes of making that are, that are starting to, to, to sort of rise up through all the muck, through all the mess, all that funk, right? all the debris, all of that, there are these extraordinary forces that are rising. We see it in wonderful young poets, incredible writers, playwrights, powerful music, dancing, new forms of making, theater, music, etc. So what I thought I would do, um, I'm going to try not to take too much of your, of your time. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a few ideas and then I wanted to share a few things with you, a few things with you. And so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to work here at this site because it's a little, it's a little different for me. Okay. All right. I'll see if I can do this, okay. So I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna share, you know, the, the, thing, the thing for me is that no, no matter what, uh, we are all in some small way sort of crawling towards our humanity. And the thing that interests me most in that sort of climb and in that dig and in that effort, that will to sort of move from one place to the next is my absolute fascination with what other artists are doing and that I spend a great deal of time with other artists, looking at them and thinking about the ways in which artists influence one another, the way artists influence one another. Um, maybe it's this way. Maybe it's that way. It's that way. Maybe. Maybe it'll be that way. <laughs> you know, like I've you know, read things uh, by, by Toni Morrison, um, um, you know, passages so exquisite and so beautiful that the only thing I could do was drop to my knees and say, You know, just glorious, glorious writing that spoke so profoundly to who I think my feelings are, what I think my feelings might be. And so paying attention to artists and to writers and to thinkers is really something that's important and I spend my day uh, thinking about other artists and spending lots of time with artists and um, uh, curating materials with other artists and making convenings with other artists and sifting through other, you know, I mean, I spend as much time with other artists as I do with uh, uh, the things that I actually make. And I spend a lot of time doing that as well. And so, you know, I started, started thinking about some, some ideas around notions of influence because I'm deeply influenced by uh, other artists. I think we all are, in one way or another, deeply influenced by what other artists are doing, how they're making. We come to them for all kinds of reasons, for our emotional understanding, for our sort of, you know, solace, for our salvation, for our um, uh, solving and asking difficult questions. We come to the arts for all kinds of reasons, but we also come to them as artists, and there are many artists and writers, and musicians and dancers, as composers and thinkers in the audience, we come to people because we are interested in their ideas. We're trying to tease out for ourselves, you know, the context in which we live. And in figuring that out, we also think about the sort of ideas about influence. And there are really wonderful uh, books that have been written about on the essay of influence, and I sort of think about it a lot in relationship to the art. In a lot of ways, you know, these ideas about influence also come through a sort of notions of appropriation. 
And so I thought that I would talk just a little bit, a little, little bit about that and what appropriation is. So sometimes appropriation is the act of simply stealing. <laughs> sometimes it's an act of exploration. Sometimes a comparison and a contrast. Sometimes an act of negotiation. Sometimes an act of renegotiation. Sometimes a marriage of singular ideas, ideas coming together to form yet new ideas. Sometimes appropriation is really simply an attack on the form itself, on the very act of appropriation. Sometimes appropriation is something or simply a hand that has been well played. Appropriation can also be, at times, something that is um, a kind of critical intervention. It can also be a disruption, a questioning of ownership and authority, of making, of worrying the line. Sometimes it's really getting something that you simply might not have otherwise. Sometimes, of course, it might be to underscore that which has come before. It might be something that is echoing the past and charting our way to sort of ideas of the future. Appropriation can be many different kinds of things, and I think of it often in the ways in which artists are teasing, going back and forth, appropriating, being influenced by using one another in order to build new forms of dialogue, in order to build new forms of uh, tr the transmission of certain kinds of ideas, in order to build new context in worlds within worlds that would not exist uh, but for the act of appropriation and ideas around influence. The thing that's always been very interesting to me about these ideas about appropriation is ideas about influence, things that have come before, things that are writing alongside of us, is that within the visual arts, there's actually been always a real problem around this idea of appropriation. In the visual arts, there's a great stock that's placed really in the original. The copy is considered to be a violation, and ownership is key, and it's highly valued. The original is thought to possess a kind of power, an inseparable essence that resides and resists interpretation, residing outside, actually, of the spoken word. And, of course, I can understand it to a certain extent. But if we come back to it again, and I think that um, I'm hoping um, uh, uh, where is uh, Daniel? Is Daniel here? I actually had, oh, okay, here, here we go. <clears throat> you know, that, 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 um, that in, in music, of course, the act of appropriation is absolutely key to making music, and there's an understanding that it's absolutely essential, that a serious musician, for instance, cannot be taken seriously if he doesn't know the standards. If he doesn't know the standards, if he can't play the standards, then he fails. The original is thought to be a foundational uh, arrangement, a foundational understanding, a foundation for the young artist coming along, and that it has to be understood and it has to be mastered. And then the act of copying, then, in music is highly regarded. It's only after you've mastered the original that then you can actually extend the original and make the original your own, right? So it's very interesting. So I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which this has sort of worked in music and the way in which musicians come along, the way in which they think about themselves in relationship to what's made and how things are made. And I thought that I'm just going to play you just a little bit of music to sort of get to this point. And uh, we won't um, hear all of them because we don't have enough time. 
But, um, you know, so I've been reading a lot. I've been reading a lot about, and, and I, I, I absolutely love Louis Armstrong. I love Louis Armstrong. And I have from almost the very beginning of my early musical interest, loved Armstrong. And um, Armstrong um, appropriated uh, the work of King Oliver, and he played with King Oliver for a long time, and he loved King Oliver. And King Oliver was a master. King Oliver wrote uh, St. Louis Blues. He wrote St. Louis Blues. And Armstrong, Armstrong recorded, recorded St. Louis Blues 75 times over the course of his life. He recorded it 75 times. Like, like he, you know, so he played it hundreds of times, but he recorded it 75 times, right? You know, that he came back to it over and 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 over, worrying that thing, that, that, within, that within that was this sort of extraordinary, this sort of extraordinary power that he was determined to unpack as an artist, right? That there was something that was so fundamental to that, to that, to that, that, thing to that song that he came back to it and every time he came back to it he came into it from a different angle always trying to get on the top of it trying to wrestle it and trying to control it in a way that he was never really quite able to to do and which is the reason that he came back to it over and 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 over fabulous like a really great 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 artist comes back to something repeatedly as young artists, people that are in the audience, that's what we have to do too. You come back to the work repeatedly and you allow the work to live. This is Armstrong, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, uh, singing Diana uh, with one of the great, great, great um, um, trumpet solos. Please. The next time we're going to swing for you from, from, is one of the good old favorites. Yes, Diana, Diana. She was Diana. completely Diana. aware of everything, of sound and how sound <laughs> functioned in relationship to his own body. Diner in the state of Carolina, if there is that you know, show to me, Diner, the dick not blazing, who love the city's gazing, to the eyes of Diner Lee, baby, every man, but I shake with fat, oh, cut my dynamite, take the mind, but it is in me, always been, always flexing, I'm having a little matter, oh, Diner. Where language, the language becomes sound, an appreciation of sound in relationship to the word, in relationship to language. Stretching it, always stretching, this sort of incredible kind of elasticity. Coming out of that sort of incredible place called New Orleans, the Banana Republic. A crazy stream of life. Out of that emerges one of the great, great, great artists of all time, not of, uh, of all time, out of the wreckage, out of the, out of the destruction, out of everything that was meant to suppress, out of everything that was meant to destroy, a man, a culture, takes hold of that and rises. And so I'm interested in the rise. How do we rise? How do we rebuild, reshape, continue on, and press? We have to hear this. Oh. Volume. Volume, please. Can't turn it Because this is fat.
<laughs> brilliant. 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 That's all there so, is. So, there you is know, I, when, I was, when I was a child, um, I, would, I, would, uh, I always sat around with my mother and her girlfriends, you know. They'd be, you know, they didn't drink wine. They, 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 they you know, had peanuts and Pepsi. <laughs> peanuts and Pepsi, and they talked about life. You know, and I was always just sort of hanging on the edge. And they were always listening to Aretha, somebody in the background. So my mother introduced me to the great, great, great Aretha Franklin, who of course uh, just uh, left us just recently. And, uh, but I've been thinking about Aretha for a long time and I've been uh, dancing uh, to her and listening to her endlessly. I think I listen to the same music almost every day. Like I wake up every morning, I go into my studio and I listen to Ode to Life by Don Pullen. And then I listen to uh, Stevie Wonder's Love's in Need of Love today. And then I listen to Bob Marley's Could This Be Love? And then I listen to uh, uh, Keep On Pushing. And that's what I exercise by and I work by. And uh, when I get home in the evenings, it's, you know, Pullins is the first thing that I turn on. Ode to life. But, uh, and, uh, and then I listen to Aretha. And I've been listening to a few of her songs over and over and over. Respect was never one of my favorite songs. I, was, I didn't like it. I thought it was boring. <laughs> but, uh, but I listened to Aretha a lot. And um, so, but Aretha, Aretha um, sang lots of other songs by other people. And uh, Glenn Campbell was a, uh, uh, wrote uh, this really beautiful song that I started listening to when I was about 13, 14 years old. It's called Gentle on My Mind. And then, um, and Glenn Campbell, who was fierce actually, right, for all that sort of oaky, hokey, corny stuff, he was like a really, really great uh, musician. And when he went out to perform, he, he, he played for everybody. He backed up for everybody. He was in everybody's like jam session and you know studio session. I mean, he was like a serious throwdown musician who could write, right? And had really beautiful, beautiful sort of capacity. And then people like uh, Aretha and uh, 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 Sinatra sang his Gentle On My Mind and I wanted to play you some snippets of that. And hopefully we'll be able to play that okay. So do we go to the next slide? I, this is a, a Dell, I, I use a Mac. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, alrighty. So this is, yes, exactly. This is, uh, this is uh, Frank Sinatra's version, I hope, of Gentle On My Mind. Thank you. And uh, who's controlling, is there someone else controlling the volume besides me? It's knowing that your door is always open and your path is free to walk. Thank you. And, and Sinatra is just That bad. makes it's me beautiful. tend to leave my Anything. sleeping bag rolled up and stashed the behind air. your couch. Beautiful annotation of wood. Like a real And it's here. knowing I'm not shackled by like forgotten you words and bonds. The ink stains that have dried words. upon great, some lines. Words. And I can see myself dancing with that my That keeps you in the back roads and, uh, by the rivers of my sad. memory. That keeps you ever gentle but on but my mind. The wheat fields and the clotheslines and the junkyards and the highways come between us. And some other woman crying to her mama Cause she turned and I was gone I still run in silence Tears of joy might stain my face Summer sun might burn me till I'm blind But not to where I cannot see you walking on the back roads by the rivers flowing gentle on my mind. Okay, so that's, that's uh, Sinatra's version, which is very beautiful and I really, really like it so much. And then um, a few years later, um, 
I think. <laughs> I really hate not knowing how to use technology. It really annoys me. Okay. Now, where are they? They're here. This is here. Okay, all righty. Thanks. All right. And just press it. from an extraordinary family did extraordinary work and then she decided because she understood something about her legacy because she is so original so so phenomenal she understood something about her legacy and she understood something about the power of the music and where, where the music has come from its validity its importance and she decided that she wanted to leave a certain kind of gift and the way that she was going to leave this gift was by working through the music of a series of young women who are singing Viva Guerrero. And she decided that she would take their songs, appropriate their songs, reshape their songs, and then put them together. This is what she does with Rolling in the Deep. Hear this? It? Yes. Okay. This is uh, Aretha on the David Letterman show. That voice. Eighty years old, she still extraordinary sense, pulling so
Sophie herself was in the appropriation. Building, repeating, and building on her own, sort of understanding of what her own music has done, the power of her own music understanding. It's dynamic, what it does, how to use it, and how to repeat it. These forms that you keep coming back to, uttering, reuttering, reshaping, remolding, and pushing the music, pushing towards the most, the deepest part of self. Understanding the blues and the gospel and bringing that into the mix, into this thing that was meant to simply be a love song to a man. greatest, greatest, greatest artists. And so I'll just say this and then we'll have our conversation with God. I was in Detroit recently and uh, we were just about to finish our, our tour. And I go to a city that I don't know anything about. I like to do a little tiny bit of a tour and I asked this brother to show me around, introduce me to Detroit. And just as we were finishing up the, the, the tour, I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 brother. I haven't seen Aretha's house. You haven't taken me to Aretha's. <laughs> She, you know, she just passed away. There's no way I could leave Detroit without seeing Aretha's home. So we go to her house, to her neighborhood. Within an eight block radius came some of the most extraordinary music of our time. <laughs> Aretha lived over here. Diana lived around the corner. Smokey lived across the street from Diana. Mary lived over here. Smokey said, I wasn't even nearly the baddest brother on my block. <laughs> Extraordinary music, m as we know it. Motown, of course, Aretha from Atlantic Records and so forth. Extraordinary. Like America would not be America. The world would not be the world without these sounds. And there was no marker. There wasn't a single marker anywhere to say that you were about to enter one of the most important neighborhoods in America in terms of the history of music and the history of violence in relationship to the history of music in this country. So um, that's my next project. <laughs> Here we come. Okay, wow. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, you know, I want to start, so given, um, I want to make sure that folks in the audience um, can ask some questions, that there's time for that. So I'm just going to 
I'm going to get us started. I'll ask a few questions, and then we're going to turn it over to you and let you join the conversation. But I want to start with this notion of the wreckage. And I want to ask a question about, um, given, you know, so the wreckage, maybe we can talk a little bit explicitly about what that is, what it, what it is now. Um, what it means for our particular, what the term might mean for a particular time and place. Um, is we live in the Trump years? Is that a kind of wreckage? Um, and, um, and then I'm thinking about this um, notion of appropriation, which seems to me to be um, the way that you're describing it kind of you know, homage and extension or something. And then I'm thinking about uh, Claudia's uh, workshop uh, off campus last night, which was focused on counter narratives, which almost seems like what's buried, and it, it addressing in some way what's buried beneath what we see and re-scripting. Um, and I'm curious about how either counter narratives deal in some way with what you imagine to be the wreckage um, and then if you could talk a little bit Carrie about the relationship between uh, this paying homage and extending and appropriation and how that might help in some ways or, or not I don't know deal with the wreckage the wreckage by Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Otherwise known as Notes of Virginia. You know, Thomas Jefferson in Notes on Virginia said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, we should send the black people back to back home because once they realize what we have done to them there will never be peace in this country it's written down so the wreckage is not trump trump is the amplification of something that is structural that is american democracy and it's a mistake to believe that you can essentialize it inside the body of one man. It runs through our history like the rivers in Pittsburgh. I, the um, driver from the airport told me there were a bunch of rivers running through. <laughs> I'm assuming it's true. <laughs> so why don't you pick it up from there? So we can touch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have your own? Um, well, um, so, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's been, uh, as you said, it's, it's, it's been a whole lot worse. So, 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 I mean, I, 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 I see it much more as, um, um, I was watching Kellyanne, Kellyanne Conway the other day, who I think is just a dreadful person, <laughs> and uh, talking, and I realized for the first time, <coughs> in a really sort of unmitigated way, in an unmitigated way, that this is, uh, the clawing for America. This is the clawing for America and what it's going to be um, as we enter this uh, new, new phase, this uh, extraordinary shift in the country where we're moving from white to brown, black and varying shades of brown, right? And that we know that this demographic shift is going to have 
huge implications. And every single institution in the United States, every single major corporation in the United States is dealing with this fact and trying to figure out how to, how to deal with this fact, how to deal with the reality of this fact, because nobody really thought that it was going to happen. <clears throat> so yes, so that's what I think a lot of it is. So yes, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, and Trump is simply the epitome of, uh, epitomizes that grab, the sort of last ditch effort for a kind of um, uh, uh, holding on to some sense of whiteness in its most blatant form, in its most reactionary form, in its most um, brutal form, um, to at least contemporarily. I, you know, I'm gonna disagree with you. Okay. Because I think it's true, we know that the majority minority shift is happening. Um, but if you look at who holds the power. Oh, of course, no, I got that, I got that. That has not shifted yeah. Yeah. at all. No. But that's so why I'm saying that it's a power struggle, right? But, but, these, but, but that's but why I'm saying it's not a power struggle. The, the, for, Have first, you first heard of, of all, South first of all, Africa? First of, all, first of all, the demographic shift hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. It is happening, it is in process, like the melting of the glaciers. It's sort of happening. And so we're all paying attention to the idea that this is happening. One of the questions is, is how do you maintain power in a democracy where the vast majority is, um, becomes brown and black? The that is the question. The electoral college. Which they are trying but to get rid of. I, I do think it's which an interesting. Which they haven't gotten rid of. Yes. An yes. interesting and question. trying to get rid of. <laughs> But these, are, but these are very interesting questions. I mean, right. I, mean I think that they are really something important and they have happening. a lot to do with who we We're are. We're on the verge something of something. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I want to turn back to um, art and poetry. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> well, well, well the, the, the art and poetry comes out of these ideas. Exactly. But I, I, I think I was listening to something that you, um, I watched a, a lot of interviews uh, um, that both of you did and, and, and read a bunch and, um, of your interviews. And one thing that you were saying at some point, Carrie, is that, there, that art is really critical in this moment in terms of what it is that's happening. That art is important. Carl Phillips writes about poetry being extremely dangerous um, in, in a particular moment like this. Um, so how is that the case? How do you imagine that being the case that, that art is extremely important in this particular moment like this, this happening? Oh, I think art is always important. Mm -hmm. I think that it becomes the, it's the, the sort of critical gateway to the, to the mind and to the heart, to the soul, and that, um, that, that ask. The thing that, the, the thing that, the, the thing that, 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 that we do is that we ask critical questions mm -hmm. and we ask the audience to ask along with us mm -hmm. or to come on that journey with us in, um, in the sort of disruptive practice mm -hmm. of asking critical questions about the time and the moment in which we live. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so that's really, I think, what we're sort of focused on. That's what I'm primarily focused on, and that's why I think it's, uh, uh, it's the thing that gets me up in the morning and the thing that takes me to bed at night, right? Mm -hmm. Of figuring out the things that I'm really sort of committed to, the kinds of ideas that I'm really interested in exploring, mm -hmm. And how do I bring that to, um, first of all, how do I process it for me um, as, as, as the sort of bearer, right, mm -hmm. the carrier of the load, because it's a load, right? And then how do I bring it to an audience so that they can uh, participate with me and share with me in the unpacking of mm -hmm. the difficulties in which we are engaged? Mm -hmm. Not unlike the piece that you've just sort of presented us with mm -hmm. tonight way in which th we are unpacking this question, right, um, is, uh, is deeply um, uh, disturbing uh, and also gratifying. But the thing that it does is it pushes us to, um, uh, to self-reflection, and that alone, I think, is valuable. Mm -hmm. so I was, you know, so what um, this makes me think about is this juxtaposition of text and image that is in both of your work. Um, your collaborations, Claudia, with um, your husband, John Lucas. The two of you, or both of you, are often bringing together text and image, um, in your case, moving image in uh, situations with the poem. Um, 
And what occurs to me in those intersections is that there's an openness that the, that the viewer or the person who encounters the work is forced to deal with. The questions are asked, but they're not answered, right? So right, the audience has to participate in that meaning making in some really deep way. And I think that when they have to grapple with kind of two modes, both you know, language and then something that they can actually see, um, it complicates the question even more. I mean, is that a strategy that, you know, to really get the audience engaged in that meaning making of the work or? Um, yes. Yes, it is a strategy. I, you know, Roland Barthes talks about the classical text mm -hmm. as a text that tries to shut down meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the original idea of the art, art object as a closed unit, a still unit. And so I'm really interested in, in how you keep the thing, whatever the thing is, trembling. Mm. So that one cannot stay still. One is uncomfortable in the, in the almost the um, metabolizing of it. And so part of the craft is to keep the tremble mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. Is as though you you've um, like in this 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 piece. Are you satisfied with it? Do you, are you asking the the questions that you want to ask? You know, are there questions that you, you that you've asked that you thought no, that's really not the question. This is really the question, right? You know, and have you, you know, like like I'm 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 always like aware of like you know what is bringing me what is bringing my audience closer to me, you know, and what is propelling them. And you know, and, 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 and asking it again through my own skin of what it is that, you know, how is it that I need to hear um, certain kinds of ideas and information in order to be pulled into it to engage it. And so I know that, some, you know, I come back to work and it's like, ah, no, you didn't quite do it there, kiddo. You made a mistake. Yeah, you know, you need to rework that. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, do you, do you, th do you have those, those moments of, of deep, deep, deep regret as well? You know, <laughs> I, you know are you happy with, with White Card? You know, I, I tend not to have those moments because it's easy for me to throw things out. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, it, it's often been the case that I, somebody, a friend of mine used to have a box and it was supposed to be my throwaway box because I would throw things out for real. And they were like, no, 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 don't throw it out. <laughs> Just put it in a throwaway box. Because it, um, but I'm, I'm working on a new book now called Just Us. And do you hear it? Justice, justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the process for that book, it's not, it's, it's out of the white card. It's like it steps right out of the white card because it's a book about conversation. And so what I did in that book was I, I wrote up conversations I had with real people. Mm -hmm. And then I hired a shrink. <laughs> I went out and I found a psychiatrist. And I said to the psychiatrist, it was very friendly, our first meeting, I said to her, this is what's gonna happen. I I, I'm going <laughs> to, I said, I'm going to give you something to read and then we're going to talk about it. And she said, well, I'm not going to read it before we get here, unless you're going to pay for another session. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, all right, then I'll read it to you. And so I go to her and I read her the, the conversation and we talk about what my blind spots are. Like, what am I not seeing? And so then we have the session around that piece. Then once I've revised a piece, I send the piece to the person who I had the conversation with. And I say to them, is this the conversation we had? And often what they say back is, well, you have a good memory for what I said, 
but this is not what I meant. And so then they write, then they write what they think they were communicating. Oh, this is so interesting. You know, I actually did that with my shrink. <laughs> Maybe who, it was who, the same shrink. Was, no, no, he was, he was, he, no, it was so crazy. He, he was, he was, he was white. I was, you know, I live in Syracuse, and so the only shrink I could find was like white. And he was completely terrorized. He was completely intimidated by me. And, and so, <laughs> you know, one day I said to him, I came into the office, I said, you know, I just feel like I'm being fucked. Right? And you know, and he was just sort of, my, this is like my psychiatrist. Sort of, it was amazing. And so I was like, like is so that I, a desire? You know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was totally, it was really, so it was, it was so interesting. And so I tried to do exactly the same thing with him, to sort of go back to him, you know, to talk to him, to, to talk through what he thought he was seeing in this encounter. So it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. Oh, no, no. Wait, no. I think you should continue. <laughs> I, have, I have one more question before we turn to the audience, which is, it comes out of this, uh, this um, idea of conversations. I was listening to um, the podcast on being. You were interviewed on that show. Um, and you told a story about a conversation on a plane. And the, and the conversation, I, I think this is right. Tell me if I'm wrong. You're talking to um, a white man. Um, you said that in another, you know, if you had met him in another place, you might actually be friends. You were having this really nice conversation and then, you know, feeling connected, I guess, to this person. And then at some point in the conversation, he said, I don't really see color or something like that. Uh -oh. And you said, don't say that. <laughs> Because when you see me, he's like, why? And you said, well, when you say that, you don't see me or something like that. Yeah. But then, you know, what you were getting at, actually, um, was something about intimacy. And, um, and something about the difficulty of intimacy with strangers in moments like this around race. Because then he said, I remember, I only listened to this once, but I remember it very clearly, he said, um, Oh, did I say anything else? And you know, you're like, no, that was that was. It. <laughs> and you kind of moved on to the rest of your conversation. And so I want I want to ask this question about difficulty and intimacy um, when it comes. And this is a question for for both of you when it comes to dealing with in the work. You know, matters of race or sex sexism, I suppose, racism, um, is, is that at work, in the work? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I didn't hear you. I don't, I don't think I know what you mean. Well, in this conversation, you were trying to get at something um, that that kind of intimacy is difficult to reach. Like you, there was a bridge, a, there was, a bridge was created and then something else happened on the other side of that bridge. But normally, we don't engage like that in conversation, as I think is what you were saying, mm -hmm. right? Well, I think, I think um, where we are is this question of intimacy and what prevents it, what gets in the way of it, mm -hmm. and how, and often we think that what gets in the way of intimacy is difficulty. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. What gets in the way of intimacy, as far as I'm concerned, is, is a kind of retreat that is occasioned out of good manners, right. out of um, dismissal, defensiveness. And this guy I met on the plane, he was a great guy. I really, I, you know, I liked him, we were chatting, and you know, I like it when I have a good uh, conversation on the plane because it makes the time go faster. You know, you're like a four hour flight, suddenly you're home, you're like, whoa, thank you. <laughs> 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 and he was, he was great. He liked, we liked the same song. What was the song, do you remember? It was, um. <laughs> I remember trying to sing the second Night one. Shift, it was Night Shift. And we sang it out loud together. <laughs> you know that song? Sing it for us. <laughs> <laughs> On the night ship, you know. And, and then he was like, uh, 
you know, I don't, you know, Claudia, I don't, I don't, I don't see race. And I really had that moment where I was like, oh God. <laughs> no, not you. And, and then we talked a little bit, and then I said to him, he said something about diversity in this company. And I said, you know, don't say that thing about not seeing race. And what I loved about him was instead of being like, shut up, he said to me, is there anything else I've said that's stupid? Inane, I think is the word he used. And I said, no, it was just that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what he did was he didn't bully the conversation. And I, and what I did that I was so proud of, and actually, the person who gave me the words for knowing this is the, the um, affect theorist, Lauren Ballon, because I was telling her about this. And, and this idea that I didn't let him bully me into a position, and I didn't let myself take on a reality that I, don't, that I know is not true which we often do in conversations. It's like, no, that reality is no reality. So let's just stay in the real reality, the one that actually, if we talked about it for a second, we could see is tangible, is real. You're white, and you're gonna go home, and you're gonna tell your wife you had a nice conversation with a black woman, and you're gonna feel good about that, because you don't often have conversations with black women. And, you know, I'm like, that's, the, and that's okay, because I am a black woman, and I kind of like it. You know, <laughs> it's a good thing, and that's fine. And so that, that's what we got out, and then we could stay intimate. And, you know, he did an incredible thing. He said to me, I really love this guy. He said to me when the plane landed, um, when I get home, I'm gonna, the kids are gonna be all over me. So I'm just gonna stay in the, pla the airport for half an hour and get some work done. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that incredible? So he, <laughs> so I, I thought, I, you know, that sense of how intimacy happens between strangers, which is what I, you know, and how it happens, maybe this is about race, but also in terms of sex, so in terms of, all I think you know about just being open, open yeah. just being open. I mean, you know, I have I've like you know very intimate conversations often with all kinds of people because I'm an intimate person and I love intimacy and I love being close to people and I want people to be close to me, right? I mean, you know, right? And so, and I, I think about that. I think about about how how to how to bring them close to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, and and so and, and I think that this 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 idea, you know, is it's 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 the, the way in which the work functions as well. I'm always thinking about how do you bring people close to you and close to the work to engage, and so it um, it is uh, the same desire that exists for me. Um, in my normal everyday life is the same thing that carries over into the work, into the work that the, to the extent that the work is powerful, that it carries forth, that it allows people to, to see themselves reflected in it is the extent to the which the work is successful. One thing, the one thing I loved about your presentation just now, I mean, it was, very smart, very interesting. Aretha, we love you. Um, but I loved you. Mm. I loved, mm -hmm. I loved the way in which we were able to understand the impact of the music through your body. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily through what you were saying, mm -hmm. but through your body. Mm -hmm. And that ability to be one with the body is something I think also mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's rare to see it publicly. Mm -hmm. It's weir weir um, rare to see the enjoyment of things mm -hmm. publicly. 
That, to me, was a gift. I, <laughs> thank you. I, I think actually that's a perfect place to end this portion of the conversation. I'm being told from this, the left side of the room that you have to save your questions for the book signing portion of this evening. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank you once again, <laughs> Carrie and Claudia.